When I was working as a therapist, we used to get really, really rapid results really fast. N not because of me, but because I had some phenomenal teachers. And I think we really need to find the best teachers we possibly can and learn from them. And I had great teachers. And we learned how to make really deep change really, really quickly that would last. I had a practice in the beaches, or is it the beach this week? I can never get it right. No, someone always yells it. Right at Queen Street and Hammersmith uh, for some time. And we worked phobias and anxieties and chronic grief and chronic depression and post-traumatic stress disorder and a lot of kids with ADD and ADHD from Sick Kids Hospital reference. And we learned how to make really quick changes. And one of my favorite things, to show you how bizarre this can be, was curing deep down lasting depression because we could often fix it in one session even if somebody had been in therapy for 12 or 15 years and so I'm going to give you a real example because we would fix depression with a wristwatch and a wall socket this is excellent so I'll draw you the wall socket to illustrate the point here notice I've only put two prongs because this isn't grounded <laughs> I'm a comic genius so anyway a woman comes in we're going to call her Susan only because that was her name. And she sits down, she's had all kinds of depression for years, she's had multiple open heart surgeries, an artificial aortic valve, they have gone, they've got her on two blood thinners, she's afraid she's gonna blow a clot through her heart all the time. She, her anxiety turns into depression. She gets depressed about being anxious. Then of course she gets sad about how depressed she is, which made her really, really depressed about being so sad. So she and this horrible nose dive. When I saw her, she, her doctor sent her to me, she was just a mess. So I figured I was going to use the watch and the wall socket method, because it's my favorite. Now most people, when they're really depressed, they're looking for sympathy, but the problem is talking about the problem doesn't typically fix it. I'm more interested in getting them to feeling better and fixed really quickly, regardless of the method. So she says, oh, I've been depressed for years. I'm depressed all the time. So instead of being sympathetic, I said, that's fantastic. And she went, what? I said, it's amazing that you're depressed all the time. I mean, that's really hard to do. That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> she said, I, I guess it is, isn't it? So now she's suddenly proud of her depression, which is good. Her state is changing. I said, tell me about your depression. Now I'm watching, I'm calibrating her external analog behavior. I'm watching her closely, and she starts to collapse into it immediately. So she's not depressed all the time. She's turning it on and off, but she doesn't realize that yet. So I said, tell me about your depression. She goes like this. <sighs> Oh, it's been a horrible couple of years, and our son's ruined our life, and he burned the garage down. I said, oh, we haven't actually started yet. She goes, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I said, that's okay. I started asking all these bizarre questions just to get her talking. You know, have you ever been to Mexico in April? Do you sleep on your left side during thunderstorms? You know, what's your brother's middle name? Weird things. So she's talking and totally distracted, and I said, okay, tell me about your depression. She goes, oh, it's been so bad. I said, no, I just meant in general terms. We're not, terms, we're not really dealing with it yet. She went, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood again. Turns it off again instantly. Now, she's beginning to learn unconsciously that she's got control over this. You can't be depressed all the time. You've got to sleep sometimes, right? So we've done this a couple of times, and I said, okay, a couple more questions. Now it's time. Tell me all about your depression. So she's, okay, I get to be depressed. <sighs> Sinks into it. Physiology collapses. She said, oh, it's been a horrible couple of years. Our son's ruined our life, and he burned the garage down. He got thrown out of school. And I start doing really, really bizarre things that have no meaning in a psychotherapeutic context, like smelling underneath my watch. <laughs> so she's talking about all this horrible, life-wrecking stuff, and I'm apparently distracted going, <sighs> and she looks at me in horror. I can still see her face, and she says, what did you just do? I act like a five-year-old caught with pornography. Nothing! Hiding it behind my back. She said, you just smelled under your watch. I said, I did not. Just deny it. I said, tell me about your depression. And she goes, okay. Um, well, for a couple of years, and that son of ours was wrecked her life. I did a really good one. I half stood up. I remember going, almost reeling backwards. She said, you are definitely smelling underneath your watch. I said, I am not. I said, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. Why would I do that? She said, I guess you wouldn't. I said, that's right. <laughs> Tell me about your depression. Now she's getting mad. Anger I can deal with. She goes, okay. And as she's telling me about the depression, she's watching to see if I go for the watch. But now I'm going to the next phase, the coup de grace, the pièce de résistance, the shot to the head. We're going for the wall socket to smell the electrons. So she says, oh, I've been really depressed. And I start standing up slowly. And she's watching. And I'm edging to the wall socket. And I'm going, yes, two years, he burned the garage down, yes, and then I did it. I went, 
She says, what are you doing now? I offer them to her. Here. <laughs> Bang! Her state changes. She jumps up. She's freaking on me. Veins standing out in her head. This is the biggest waste of money in my life. My psychiatrist said you're good and you could help me. What is this, candid camera or something? Am I going to see this on YouTube? This is horrible. This is disgraceful. I said, I'm still writing. I said, sit down. Tell me about your depression. She says, no, you're going to start smelling stuff. <laughs> I said, I won't. I promise I won't smell anything. Tell me about your depression. She goes, well, it's been too... And it, that's weird. It's gone. Cha-ching, cured. Spoke to her two years later. It never came back, because every time she tries to get into her depressed state, which was something she was doing, not something that was happening to her, she'd see me smelling electrons and things. I mean, you can do almost anything. I used to go, <laughs> you know, anything to fragment the state. So most change happens at an unconscious level. And how do we get to the unconscious? Language. In fact, let me show you a really quick way of affecting other people's behavior. If we're going by our 0.1% uh, conscious, the rest is unconscious, our trillion neurons, this beach ball, basketball, whatever. Well, it looks way more round from this angle. Okay, this is the entirety of your unconscious mind. And your conscious mind is a tiddlywink or a dime sitting on top of this. So that's the conscious mind. And between the two, you've got a thing called the critical fac faculty. And the critical faculty is like the guardian at the gate. And it's like, think of a, a little coaster that you can put your coffee cup on. So the dime is on the coaster, and the coaster is on top of a, a basketball. And the critical faculty determines what information is able to get into your unconscious mind and influence your behavior. So if I were to put you in a hypnotic state, the critical faculty does not disappear. It simply moves out of the way and lets information go back and forth into the unconscious. The thing is, how many people here have young kids or did at one time? All right. What happens if you say to a really young kid, say three, four years old, don't spill that milk on the couch. <laughs> yes, you laugh, because a lot of the time, somehow he or she spills it, even though you said don't spill it. Now, the reason why is little kids do not have a critical faculty. Critical faculty will tell you what is true and what is false. It is installed by about age six by modeling authority figures. That's why if you say to a, a four-year-old boy, hey, Johnny, there's a purple dragon out in the hall, and he's got some candy for you, he'll go, run up the hall. There's no dragon with candy for me. And you go, <laughs> of course not, Johnny. You don't have a critical faculty. One day you'll be an adult and you'll understand. And you walk away chuckling happily to yourself as he sobs in the corner. Now, the reason why is if I say to you, okay, there's a you know, purple dragon out in the hall. He's got candy for you. You know, A, dragons don't exist. B, if said rap reptile does exist, the chance of being purple is somewhat remote. And then the chance of him being a purveyor of confectionery to small children is almost non-existent, so I'm hoping you don't go check. Now, if the thing about our brain with the critical faculty is it enables us to process negatives. It's the only way we can process a negative is by deletion. If I say to you, don't spill that milk, you make an unconscious picture of spilling the milk, and then you delete it. We don't want that, or hit the delete key or white it out or something. You say to someone without a critical faculty, a very young child, don't spill that milk. They make an unconscious representation of spilling the milk, but they don't get around to deleting it. They somehow jostle it, knock it over, and they're wah! And the kids always cry the same way in frustration as opposed to pain. They do what I call the Mandel octave shift. I'm the only scientist who's documented this. They start with a low guttural sobbing, two seconds of silence, and a thin wailing note. It goes like this. <laughs> Listen for it.